Atsumu's gaze now wandered back to Aiko. He was totally lost, for him Aiko spoke in riddles. He didn't know what was going on at all. What do you mean? Aiko. Sakusa's deep voice made Atsumu shiver. He now looked him in the face again. His expression was, as far as Atsumi could tell through the mask, quite tense. We shouldn't settle this here. Do you have time right now? I would like to tell you about it at my home. Um, yeah, sure. Aiko pressed something on her ear and spoke. Maria, -e, we are going home. Aiko smiled, and Atsumi could see Sakusa smiling a bit too, as the wrinkles at his eyes tightened a bit. He only now discovered that Aiko was wearing a headset. Sakusa must be wearing one in his ear as well. They were probably communicating with Kimori. Aiko jumped up and grabbed Atsumu's hand. So, here we go. Atsumu smiled and grabbed Aiko's hand. Then they made their way to her home. Arriving at Aiko's, Atsumu followed her into the huge living room. Sakusa closed behind them. Aiko sat down on the couch and signaled for Atsumu to sit down as well. Sakusa brought them something to drink. Suo, what kind of job is this? Atsumu, before I tell you about it, we need to clear something up first. You don't have to take this job, really no one is forcing you. But you should also know that, if you don't take it, we can't keep in touch any longer. Atsumu tilted his head. He raised an eyebrow and looked at Aiko in confusion. I mean like no contact at all. That would be dangerous for everyone here. Atsumu frowned, not understanding anything at all. Aiko smiled a little embarrassed now. I would like to hire you as my bodyguard. Huh. Bodyguard? What's so dangerous about that? Aiko took a deep breath. I like you Tsumu, and I hate myself a little for dragging you into this, but I honestly couldn't think of any other idea how to keep you as a friend. Atsumu's eyebrows were still pressed together. Bodyguard? It's no problem. I like you too Aiko, and it would be bad if something would happen to you. Atsumu smiled at Aiko. He thought it was about the incident a few months ago. He thought Aiko was scared now and therefore needed someone at her side. Aiko sighed and shook her head. It's not like that Atsumu. Aiko took a deep breath and looked at Atsumu a bit anxiously. My family is very famous in the art scene. My parents have traded a lot with extremely valuable objects and jewelry. Some things. Let's just say some things don't go very legally. Atsumu raised an eyebrow again and looked at Aiko in confusion. Aiko pulled out a necklace from under her t-shirt, which she wore around her neck. Maybe you heard about the burglary of Japan's largest treasury? Do you mean the one 22 years ago? Exactly. Aiko leaned towards Atsumu and showed him her necklace a little closer. It was still hanging around her neck. These lapis lazuli stones are from the jewels that were stolen from it. My. My parents stole them. This necklace here was made by my mother. She was pregnant with me at that time. That was supposed to be her last robbery. And as a memory of that, and as a gift to me, she made this necklace from the stolen jewels. Atsumu's eyes widened. He was amazed and admired the necklace. Until Aiko hid it under her t-shirt again. She smiled faintly. My mother died many years ago, and my father lives in our main house. You must be wondering now, why I'm telling you all this? Aiko continued to smile, more pained than sincere. Atsumu frowned. There is this man. Sikiai too. He was madly in love with my mother, and he was willing to do anything to get rid of my father. Kiyumi's and Motoya's families have therefore protected my father long before. Aiko sighed and grabbed her necklace through her t-shirt. Her gaze now tilted to the floor. Siki couldn't take it when my mother died, so now he's after this necklace as a memory of her. He also wants the death of my family and for that he doesn't get his hands dirty himself. I've only seen him once myself. Atsumu fell completely silent. Aiko always seemed so light-hearted, so happy, so carefree. He'd never have thought that there was such a story behind this fragile person. Was it him who wanted to kidnap you back then? Aiko's and Sakusa's gaze moved to Atsumu. Aiko nodded. Yes. He managed to separate me from Kiyo and Mori. Atsumu reached for Aiko's hand and gave her a warm smile. But then you came Tsumu. Aiko reached for Atsumu with her other hand and smiled back weakly. And you knew immediately what to do. You had everything under control. I, I only know that from Kiyo or from Mori. You were so special Tsumu. Atsumu blushed as Aiko praised him like that. 
Sakusa stood up and frowned, then turned his gaze to Atsumu and began to speak calmly. You are athletic. You analyze the situation perfectly. You didn't hesitate for a minute. You could really be a huge help to us. Atsumu swallowed and then smiled awkwardly. Well, I was almost a professional athlete. I guess that's how I acquired the skills. Eiko squeezed Atsumu's hand and smiled at him again a little sadly. You still need to learn how to handle weapons and how to defend yourself. Kiyo and Mori would show you all that, but Sumu, I'm not lying when I say that the whole thing is really freaking dangerous. When it comes down to it, you have to be able to kill someone because I'm not the only target thereafter. Eiko looked Sakusa seriously in the eyes. They would like to have Kiyo and Mori gone as well. Atsumu swallowed, pulling his hands away from Eiko again. He sweated a little as he understood the seriousness of the situation. And did he say yes? Kamori burst in and saw the three of them in the living room, all with serious expressions. Ahoho, did someone die, or why are you looking so gloomy? I honestly just told Sumu everything, Mori. Eiko rubbed the back of her head and smiled sheepishly at him. Kamori leaned over the couch to add Sumu and smiled at him. He was completely carefree, the seriousness of the situation didn't seem to bother him at all. You know Sumu, Sakusa couldn't get you out of his mind. You made quite an impression on him, and believe me, that's supposed to mean something. Atsumu smiled. I'm the one who impressed him, but it's rather the other way around. Sakusa blushed and gave Kamori an annoyed look, but he just grinned broadly at him. Of all the bodyguards we have, Sakusa is really the best. I hate to say it, but he's even better than me. It means something, if he sees potential in you. Mori, don't put Sumu under so much pressure. Atsumu turned his head back to Eiko and gave her a smile. Let me protect you Eiko. Eiko's eyes widened and sparkled. Atsumu. She jumped up and threw herself into Atsumu's arms and hugged him tightly, making Atsumu smile. Are you sure about this? Atsumu nodded. Atsumu. Eiko hugged Atsumu even more, which made Atsumu and Kamori laugh. The corners of Sakusa's mouth twitched a little as well. Thank you thank you. Kamori patted Atsumu on the shoulder. Thanks, man. Atsumu smiled at him, but his smile quickly disappeared thinking about how he was going to explain it to Osamu and Suna. I just don't know how to explain this to Samu. Just tell him that I hired you as a personal assistant. HMM. I don't really want to lie to Samu. He would know right away anyway. Just tell him the truth. You are Aiko's personal bodyguard because she deals with rare jewelry. You don't have to go into details and tell him about the dangerous things. HMM. Yeah that should work. Thanks Omi. Sakusa's eyes widened and sparkled. He blushed, which luckily no one could see under his mask. He looked into Atsumu's honey colored eyes that beamed at him and lost himself in them. His blonde hair falling perfectly so that a few strands lay above his eyes. How could anyone be so beautiful? Eiko giggled and Kamori gave Sakusa a poke in his arm, bringing him back to reality. Kamori smirked. Got a new nickname. Kiyo? Sakusa gave Kamori an annoyed look. So it's settled then. Welcome to the team Tsumu. Yay. Atsumu closed his eyes and smiled. Sakusa was transfixed by the sight. Suddenly, his eyes widened and he gulped. No. This feeling really isn't good at all. A few weeks passed, and Atsumu was now living with Eiko, Kamori and Sakusa. While Kamori taught him how to handle weapons, Sakusa showed him which close combat techniques were useful and practical. Atsumu always looked forward to the training with Sakusa. Although the two were so different, they harmonized perfectly. Atsumu really enjoyed Sakusa's calm personality. The two became quite good friends, yet Sakusa sometimes acted cold and dismissive towards Atsumu. But Atsumu just thought that was Sakusa's moody nature. The house they lived in was guarded by other people, so Kamori and Sakusa could at least switch off from work at home. While Sakusa was usually always at Eiko's side to make sure that no one would come too close to her, Kamori, Sakusa's cousin, kept an eye on everything from a distance. He usually hid in a high-rise building, his weapon always at hand, to be able to intervene in a dicey situation. Kamori was responsible for everything tactical and gave all the information he could gather around him and his colleagues over a headset to them. Sakusa was by far the best on the team. 
he was smart and skillful, he worked extremely carefully and cautiously, mistakes never really happened to him, and that's exactly why he received great recognition from almost everyone. He was really appreciated. Aiko was supposed to follow into her father's footsteps, although she didn't really want to. She loved jewelry and had already acquired a wide knowledge herself, but she hated stealing things and not being able to trade them legally. Forced to do so, she had also acquired some medical knowledge in the meantime, as she didn't want to be powerless in case something happened to both Kamori and Sakusa. Atsumu was a great relief for the two, he learned quickly, and was really good at what he did, they could also easily entrust Eiko to him alone. Sakusa and Kamori could then set out, to gather information about new valuable jewels, or just to find out new things about Siki. Eiko and Atsumu were cooking dinner, while Sakusa and Kamori were following a trail that might lead to Siki. They knew that, if they could somehow eliminate him, they could live a somewhat normal life. Atsumu oh, do you have a girlfriend? Um, no, not anymore. But you had one. Yes, but that was two years ago. Our relationship has always been more friendly than romantic. Eiko smiled. Then you parted on good terms. Atsumu returned Eiko's smile and nodded. Yes, we remained friends. Even though I haven't heard from her in a while now, I know I would get along with her again at the drop of a hat. You're just a great person to get along with Tsumu. The two grinned at each other. Atsumu blushed a little. How about you Eiko? Is there someone you like? Eiko's smile disappeared and her eyes widened. She turned all red and abruptly turned her face away from Atsumu and tried to focus on cooking. Atsumu laughed at that sight. Who is it? I, I can't tell you that. Atsumu tilted his head and looked at Eiko a little confused. Then he ruffled through her hair. Whoever it is, maybe he feels the same way. Eiko shook her head a little sadly and smiled weakly. We are definitely just friends. Atsumu frowned and was about to say something when the front door slammed open and a familiar voice called out to Eiko in panic. Eiko. Eiko winced, shock written all over her face. She dropped everything and hurried in the direction Sakusa's voice came from. Atsumu closed behind her. They rushed into the medical room where they were treating minor injuries. There, Kamori lay unconscious on a table. Sakusa panicked and tried to stop his bleeding. Eiko's face turned pale Atsumu's eyes widened. Mori. There was blood everywhere. 